how would you commit the perfect murder? The perfect murder is one where you don't know there's been a murder. It's put down as the, to another cause. Hi, I'm Professor Alan Jameson, and today we're going to be answering some of the internet's biggest questions about forensic science. Deep Extra. Uh, so the question is, uh, my lecture says it's not the job of the scientist um, to decide uh, innocence or guilt, uh, but just to provide evidence. Your lecturer is correct. The scientist provides um, evidence, and as I've already described, evidence is something that supports or negates a story. Frankly, for myself, I don't really care about the outcome. Most of the cases I've been involved in, I don't know the outcome. Uh, it would only be a high profile case. Um, so the question is, could my DNA end up at the scene of a crime that I've never been at? And the answer is very clearly yes. A lot of my work is actually involved in looking at those types of possibilities. The sensitivity of the DNA technology now is such that you might not have been somewhere, but we find your DNA. As an example of how sensitive these techniques have become, there's recent papers where people have just set up traps in woods and they're trapping the air in the wood and using that as a, a means of determining what species are in the wood. The cellular material in the air uh, from the animals in an area and we're developing DNA profiles from those. So now we move to a crime scene, which let's, let's say a house. People come and go from houses, that's why they're there. But the people in those houses will also meet other people and thereby transfer people's DNA from outside of the house, inside to the house, and then onto objects in the house. The, the question then is how did forensic work uh, before the 20th century in effective and fair judicial systems? I'm going to leave the uh, fair judicial systems to others. I mean, there are claims that, you know, forensic goes back to Greek times. This word forensic simply means in a legal context. Unfortunately for you, um, I was born in the 20th century and all of my experiences in the 20th century. That's when th things like fingerprints came along. But there were other attempts to identify individuals, uh, so-called anthropometric uh, systems, where they would measure, for example, the length of someone's arms, uh, their legs, anything at all. They would measure those and then match them to the suspect. It wasn't long before there were people with almost identical uh, measures on these parameters. And fingerprints, they emerged as the uh, ideal identification system in the early 20th century. But fingerprints were definitely used in India for identification by the British authorities, I think even before the 20th century. I, I think it's important to understand that all the forensic evidence is really corroborative. There, sh there should be other evidence. Um, there are very few examples where simply DNA alone, uh, as an example, or fingerprints alone, uh, would be enough for a conviction that there should be other corroborative uh, information there. So, do fingerprints during crime scenes actually matter like they do in the movies? Uh, well, it depends on the circumstances of the case. Sometimes fingerprints are relevant and sometimes they're not. An outside scene, for example, there might be many people's fingerprints, but an indoor scene, there should be a restricted number. So what you're actually doing is looking for fingerprints that maybe shouldn't be there or they're on an object which is relevant to the actual crime. Criminals will take, if, if you want to call them anti-forensic measures, crimes of passion, by which I'll, I'll, I'll say it's just impulsive crimes. People tend not to plan that uh, so well and therefore there's an increased chance of leaving uh, forensic evidence around. Re remember a fingerprint isn't always a perfect uh, print, the nature of the print, how it's uh, applied, whether it can be lifted. A patent print, for example, is where you can actually see the print, where somebody's maybe touched oil or anything that would then leave something you could easily see. And then you've got what's called latent prints. A latent print is where you wouldn't see it, and that's where you see the crime scene examiner using, for example, the powder. Or if you get it to the lab, then you would use a super glue fuming to visualize the print, and then you can lift it from there. Everything in forensic science depends on the context. In, in some instances, uh, a mark will be relevant, in others, it won't be relevant. Less than 25% of murderers leave behind DNA evidence. 
Uh, well, that's curious because the uh, how do you know there's been a murder? Where do you get that statistic? And is it just in one country? Is it across all lots of countries? Uh, every time I read a statistic like that, uh, my first question is, how would you know that? There may be murders that are undetected. You know, that's, if you like, the perfect crime. I'm often asked about that, you know, how would you commit the perfect murder? The perfect murder is one where you don't know there's been a murder. It's put down as the, to another cause. Maybe they have left DNA evidence, but we, we don't have their name and address. So we pick up DNA evidence, we've got a profile, but we can't match it to anyone. So does that count as the murderers left um, the DNA evidence, or is it some, somebody who's innocent who's left the DNA evidence? So I kind of doubt that statistic. So what happens when a, a person's DNA is found at a crime scene? Frequently we don't even know if there's DNA. If you've got a, a, a mark that you can actually see or you've got things like blood, semen, saliva, then it's quite easy to expect that there'll be DNA there. Uh, but nowadays the sensitivity of DNA uh, testing is such that you, you won't see uh, the DNA. It's microscopic, it's carried on in cells. Um, cells are very small. You get about 10,000 cells in the head of a pin and we can produce a profile. Well, I, strictly speaking, from as few as one cell, but generally speaking, uh, down to about 100, say, uh, we can produce a profile. So it doesn't take a lot. And so what happens then is that that's swabbed. Uh, that can be done either at the scene or in the lab. And then what we do is we extract the DNA and produce the profile. Most of the cases that I see nowadays are mixed DNA profiles because of the sensitivity. So when a weapon, for example, might have been handled by a number of people, it may not have been handled by everyone whose DNA is on there because somebody else has transferred uh, another person's DNA onto something that they've touched. So if I shake your hand, for example, uh, you could transfer my DNA onto the next thing that you touch. Can there be measures taken to limit that contamination? When we talk about crime scenes, you should include things like items that are taken back to the lab, an article of clothing, a weapon. You can consider that a crime scene in the sense that there'll be evidence on it that we're actually trying to find. When I talk about a crime scene, um, generally, I'm talking about anything that we want to extract evidence from, which leads us to the question of what's evidence. Evidence is something that either helps to prove or disprove a story. Uh, and it's important to realise that not everything in a room is evidence. And that's one of the issues that a crime scene investigator has initially, is what's evidence and what's just things lying around the room. So the question is, how, how do the police catch people using fingerprints and DNA? Well, that gets right to the nub of what most of forensic science is about, which is two major issues. First, is there a match between two things, whether it be hair, paint, fibres, glass, um, or DNA? And what's the significance of that match? What's the chance of that happening by accident, if you like? So for example, we know the perpetrators have got black hair and the defendant has black hair. Well, that's a match, but it's not very significant because many people have black hair. I used to have black hair. These are the two key things. And so what we need to do is there's no point finding a fingerprint if you've nothing to match it to. This is why police work is still so important because you need to look at other things, uh, intelligence, CCTV, any other part of a normal police investigation that can then identify a suspect and then that gives you something to uh, match material from the suspect to. If um, DNA uh, becomes mixed from two people at a crime scene, um, is it possible to separate the DNA from both people? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, what you get is a mixed profile. If your DNA had the profile AB, and my profile was CD. At a crime scene, what we would see is the profile ABCD. So therefore, yeah, I could be a contributor to that, but someone else who might have the profile uh, BC, they could be regarded as a contributor to that. So as soon as you start to mix people's DNA, you generate new, if you like, suspect profiles or profiles that could be actual contributors. But nowadays we're looking at anywhere between 17 and 20 odd areas of DNA and the number of profiles that you can generate 
um, from a, a mixture of just two people's DNA it goes into the billions and trillions. You can thank the British for inventing DNA testing. Uh, yes and no. First use of DNA in forensic uh, science was definitely in the UK by Sir Alec Jeffries. The technique there is called RFLP, a restriction fragment length polymorphism. The reality is it's a very different technique from the one that's now used, which is PCR. Um, now, of course, you've heard of PCR from COVID testing, uh, but this was actually uh, invented, or you could say invented, uh, by a guy called Carrie Mullis in, in the Canada. So the, the answer to that is yes, the idea of using DNA uh, was definitely developed first in the UK, but the technology that we use now was not developed in the UK. So the, the, the question here is about ancestor DNA and you know your 5% pygmy or whatever. These are very general kind of uh, inferences that people make from the types of uh, DNA uh, that are in a person. So for example, you know, red hair is prevalent in Celtic populations um, and there are genes that control hair colour. Well, you may have some of those. And so somebody says, oh, you're X percent Celtic. Personally, I have no faith in them whatsoever, and they certainly, the percentages are, are, are just nonsense. So, and frankly, I'm never sure why anybody would care, <laughs> but that's just me.